well be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to haul and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace and to stable relations between our two nations. I call upon him further to abandon this course of world domination and to join in an historic effort to end the perilous arms race and to transform the history of man. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere. And we hope around the world, God willing, that goal will be achieved. Since America possessed overwhelming military superiority in 1962, the Soviets had no choice but to back down and to remove their missiles from Cuba. But did they heed President Kennedy's call to give up their goal of world domination and to end the arms race? We will focus on that question for the next half hour. While we were celebrating our bicentennial, there was another kind of celebration going on in Moscow. At the 25th Party Congress, which took place in February 1976, Leonid Brezhnev's tone was triumphant. In the struggle with the nations of the West, the Soviet Union had indeed been winning. This man, long confined to Soviet prison camps, has been a teacher, a war hero, a political prisoner, a writer, and a Nobel Prize winner. Now he is a man exiled. His name, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. At an AFL-CIO dinner honoring him, he warned the American people, Why should there be nuclear war? if for the last 30 years they have been breaking off as much of the West as they wanted. Piece after piece, country after country, and the process keeps going on. You can simply be taken with bare hands. Like Brezhnev, Solzhenitsyn is Russian. He too sees communism and the free world locked in mortal conflict. Like Brezhnev, he sees the West is losing. But while Brezhnev is proud of the results and confident of the future, Solzhenitsyn is alarmed. In 1975 alone, four countries were broken off. Four. The very process keeps going on, and very rapidly, too. Vietnam has been a glorious victory. After Vietnam, it was Laos and Cambodia who won their freedom. This is communism's view of war. War is necessary. War is an instrument for achieving a goal. The victories of the National Liberation Movement open up new horizons. This means the development of a worldwide revolutionary process. The communist ideology is to destroy your society, to destroy the way of life known in the West. Detente does not in the slightest way abolish and cannot abolish the laws of the class struggle. Capitalism is a society without a future. Brezhnev's four and a half hour speech was a progress report on the victories achieved through using all elements of Soviet conflict forces. Military, economic, political, social, ideological, psychological, and subversive. Of all the elements of power, military strength is the one for which there can be no substitution in achieving the Soviet goal of world domination. With only half the gross national product of the United States, the Soviets have outspent Americans on the military for many years. They are spending three times as much of their gross national product as the United States, actually spending 50% more than the United States for arms. Such a rapid and intense armament program has not occurred since Hitler's armament of Germany before World War II.
The military maneuvers shown here illustrate the type of warfare which can be used by the Warsaw Pact forces against Western Europe. The Warsaw Pact has the largest assembly of military forces in the world, with a better than two to one advantage in numbers of combat vehicles over the NATO forces. Unlike our forces, their military vehicles are equipped with defenses against chemical and bacteriological warfare, as well as nuclear radiation. War games like these are held at least once a year by the Warsaw Pact forces. Because these maneuvers are so similar to actual war operations, NATO commanders often worry that they will result in actual invasion of Europe without warning. The top-ranking military officer of NATO, Admiral of the Fleet, Sir Peter Hill Norton. The Soviet Union and its allies have, in their military policies, shown a steady and continuous improvement in both the quality and the quantity of their weapons, equipment and training with a growing and inescapable emphasis being placed on offensive as opposed to defensive capability. As far as ground forces are concerned, Warsaw Pact forces enjoy a clear numerical superiority in combat formations actually stationed in Eastern Europe and the three Western military districts of the Soviet Union. This superiority is most marked in the distribution of tanks and heavy artillery where the Warsaw Pact superiority, in terms of numbers, is now of the ratio of three to one. In the air, there's been a formidable increase in the strength of the Warsaw Pact tactical air armies in Central Europe in recent years, which is most clearly reflected in the introduction of tactical aircraft with a deep penetration capability, and in the production of more and improved fighter aircraft specifically designed for offensive ground attack roles to be carried out in advance of ground forces. We, in the West, depend on our sea lifelines for what we eat, the energy and raw materials which keep our industry going, and for the support of our armed forces. But the Warsaw Pact doesn't. Why have the Russians expended such enormous resources on their Navy. In the early 1960s, the Soviet Navy was principally a coastal defense force. Since then, the Soviet Union has built more than 1,300 ships in an unprecedented buildup of world naval power. With 1,440 active combat ships of all types in their fleet, the Soviets now have a very significant advantage over the United States in many areas. In submarines, the Soviets have nearly a three to one advantage over the United States and continue to produce an average of one submarine every five and a half weeks. In major surface combat ships, the Soviets have 30% more than we have. When all types of active combat ships, large and small, are counted, the Soviets' numerical advantage is six to one. While the United States is just beginning to deploy surface-to-surface -surface missiles, the Soviet Navy has been heavily armed with both offensive surface-to-surface -surface and surface-to-air missiles for more than a decade. the Supreme Allied Commander Atlantic, Admiral Kidd. What used to be an Atlantic lake in the minds of the Alliance and the United States is now indeed an Atlantic moat filled with predatory steel sharks, if you will, conceived and constructed in the Soviet Union. The Soviets have a well-balanced fleet, fine cruisers, destroyers, air-capable ships, and most recently, the Kiev. The Soviets are continuing acquiring a disquieting capability at sea. 
how serious is our predicament? How much more time have we? Uh, there's only one individual that can answer that, and that would undoubtedly be a gentleman in the Kremlin. The simple fact of the matter is the numbers available to the Soviets to concentrate is rapidly becoming greater than the numbers available to the United States and to the NATO alliance. It's the future that bothers me. It must bother you because the trends are all in the wrong direction. A strategic offensive weapon is one with a long-range capability which the United States or the Soviet Union can use to directly strike the other, such as long-range bombers, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and sub-launched ballistic missiles. This is a Soviet intercontinental ballistic missile, or ICBM, which can reach the United States 30 minutes after launch. While the United States stopped building ICBMs unilaterally in the mid-1960s, the Soviets continued to build even after they passed U.S. numerical levels about 1969. Many Soviet ICBM sites are camouflaged like this one. They now deploy at least 1,500 ICBMs to our 1,054, giving them about one and a half times as many as we have. Despite the SALT agreement, the Soviets have unveiled four new model ICBMs since 1972, many equipped with multiple warheads, called MIRVs. The U.S. has introduced no new ICBMs except updated versions of the Minuteman in more than a decade. Reports indicate that mass production of these highly accurate Soviet missiles is currently underway and they are being deployed. No new ICBMs are being deployed in the United States. The new Soviet ICBMs, with their increased accuracy, have the power to destroy U.S. Minutemen in their hardened silos, because present U.S. policy is to fire only after an attack. The SS-9, a massive Soviet ICBM, can deliver a 25 megaton warhead, more than 1,000 times as large as the atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima. About 300 SS-9s are now deployed in the Soviet Union. The Yankee-class ballistic missile submarine is similar to the American Polaris in that it carries 16 ballistic missiles, strategic weapons, and is nuclear-powered. In ballistic missile submarines, their advantage is 75 to our 41, more than 3 to 2. Their newest Delta-class submarine has a ballistic missile, the SSN-8, with a range of 4,200 nautical miles, 1,600 miles longer than any of our sub-launched ballistic missiles. It is capable of reaching any target in the United States from protected Soviet waters. The United States won't have a comparable missile until the first Trident submarine is ready in 1979. The Soviet Union has the largest bomber force in the world today, numbering 825 medium and heavy bombers. This is almost double the U.S. force, which has been cut back to 421. Their medium bombers can reach targets in the United States, either by refueling or by one-way missions. This model shows the Soviets' new long-range supersonic backfire bomber. 86 are already deployed in combat squadrons. Yet the plane is so secret that no film has been officially released. This new aircraft can reach targets all over the United States. The comparable American bomber, the B-1, is still under construction and won't be deployed until the early 1980s. This chart is a comparison of the overall trend in strategic offensive delivery vehicles. Bombers, ICBMs, sub-launched ballistic missiles, and long-range sub-launched cruise missiles. From 1966, projected through 1980. The Soviets moved ahead of the United States in 1969, 
and now have, in some respects, the same superiority over us as we had over them at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The only U.S. advantage is in numbers of warheads, but the huge size of many Soviet missiles gives them a three or perhaps even five to one advantage in total explosive power, as this Air Force chart presented to the Senate in 1976 shows. We could not include these mobile missile launchers in the comparison charts because we have no idea how many of them the Soviets have or where they are. They can be easily concealed from our satellites in underground garages and can be moved rapidly from one location to another. They are not restricted in the SALT-1 agreement and the U.S. has none. The Soviets have many different models of mobile missile launchers, both medium range for use against targets in Western Europe and intercontinental versions to reach the United States. Some are very new, such as the SS-16 and the SS-20. These mobile missile launchers can head off across a field, set up and fire in minutes. At the Strategic Air Command, General Doherty, Commander-in-Chief. We in the United States are being seriously challenged in many areas today. None more important than the emerging imbalance that we are experiencing with the strategic nuclear forces of the Soviet Union. We see capable high-performance bombers being developed and made operational. A blue water Soviet Navy, a surface Navy, a submarine fleet, new models of intercontinental ballistic missiles, multiple independently targetable warheads. All of the things add up to a momentum that's driving us further and further apart in out years uh, as we continue uh, without major modification of our strategic forces. In my judgment, we must not permit the momentum of these Soviet programs to go unchallenged. We must not permit them an imbalanced superior position in the area of strategic weaponry. It would give them a crucial position at any negotiating table. If we permit this to happen in the future, we can expect disabling blackmail and coercion on us and our allies. Our only alternative under those circumstances would be to throw ourselves on the mercy of the Soviet Union and seek their generosity. I don't think we can afford to risk our country and its allies to such an unpalatable prospect. The Soviet Union has always stressed defense more than the United States, both in capability to detect and to defend. They have operational today the most extensive integrated air defense network the world has ever known. With over 50 times the radars we have, the Soviets can detect enemy aircraft or missiles coming in from any direction. Radars also provide initial guidance for air defense surface-to-air missiles or SAMs. The Soviets now have a force of over 12,000 SAMs on launchers. The U.S. has recently dismantled all of its strategic SAM defenses. Some Soviet SAMs can shoot down nearby low-flying aircraft, while others have ranges of over 100 miles. The Soviet fleet of fighter interceptors to guard against bomber attack stands at 2,600, over eight times the size of the continental United States force of 315. Soviet supersonic fighters can easily overtake our aging B-52 bombers from behind. At the North American Air Defense Command, General James, Commander-in-Chief. Well, I think the trend can be clearly seen when uh, you uh, consider the fact that we've gone from uh, 1,500 fighters down to 300 today. 
uh, when we have gone in radars from 300 radars to down, down to approximately 100 today, and uh, where our anti-ballistic missile system, which was the best one that had ever been developed in the history of mankind, uh, although it did protect just a small segment of the sky uh, over this country, was the best quantum jump in technology that had ever been known and was beyond our wildest dreams uh, in its effectiveness. However, uh, Congress in this wisdom decided that uh, it was too expensive to maintain uh, for uh, the small uh, amount of sky that it, it protected and they voted it up. Uh, the Russians have deployed their anti-ballistic missiles around their center of government and they haven't cut it back at all. In fact, I think they're continuing to try to refine it to the point where it can be as good as ours was. A comparison of the trends in Soviet and American defensive forces, SAMs and fighter interceptors, but not including the Soviet ABMs, from 1966 projected through 1980, shows how the United States has almost totally disarmed its defensive forces. We have no defense against uh, ballistic missiles. No, we don't. The reason for the dismantling of our defenses is that our government has adopted the doctrine of mutual assured destruction. The theory is that if the Russian and American people are undefended, they serve as hostages against nuclear war. Because if one side strikes first, the other could retaliate against their civilian population. Therefore, you personally play an important strategic role for the United States, that of hostage. One trouble with the theory is that the Soviet Union is defending its people. America's foremost expert on Soviet civil defense, Dr. Gure. The Soviet Union has always regarded civil defense as an integral part of its warfighting capability and its defense posture. It believes civil defense to be a decisive strategic factor which can determine the outcome of a war and the attainment of victory. Consequently, the Russians have been spending a great deal of effort over the last 20 years to achieve a major civil defense capability. The United States might lose as many as 100 million people in the event of a Soviet attack and a greater part of its industry. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, might lose less than it did in World War II, that is less than 20 million people, and assure the survival of most of its industry. We see, therefore, that the Soviet Union not only has essentially eroded our deterrence posture, that it has a capability of exercising nuclear blackmail of the United States in crisis situation, and if war were to come about, it could survive as a power and therefore win a war with us. At Princeton University, Nobel Prize winning nuclear physicist, Dr. Wigner. The total explosive power in Russian missiles is now about six times greater, six times greater than the explosive power in our missiles. I have calculated what losses we could inflict. If they evacuate their cities, the maximum damage that we could inflict on them would be about 4%, less than 4% of the population. They could destroy or threaten to destroy 45% of our population. At one time, there was no comparison between the strength of the USSR and yours. Then it became equal to yours. Now, as all recognize, it's becoming superior to yours. Soon it will be 2 to 1, then 3 to 1, Finally, it will be five to one. With such a nuclear superiority, it will be possible to block the use of your weapons. And on some unlucky morning, they will declare, attention, we are marching our troops to Europe. And if you make a move, we will annihilate you. And this ratio of three to one or five to one will have its effect. You will not make a move. A concentration of world evil, of hatred for humanity, is taking place. And it is fully determined to destroy your society. Must you wait until it comes with a crowbar to break through your borders? 
until the young men of America have to fall defending the borders of their continent? The Secretary of the Navy in 1976, J. William Middendorf II. Today we face a Soviet threat far greater than any other threat this nation has ever faced in its 200 years of existence. Which one of us will want to say to his child or grandchildren when we had the opportunity to protect our freedoms and to rebuild our strength? We didn't do it. That lonely voice of Solzhenitsyn is right when he says, we must reassert our will to protect our freedoms. In the few precious moments of freedom that we may have left, let's not be found wanting. Only through such strength can we be certain of deterring a nuclear attack or an overwhelming ground attack upon our forces and our allies. Only through such strength can we in the free world should that deterrent fail, face the tragedy of another war with any hope of survival. And that deterrent strength, if it is to be effective and credible, when compared with that of any other nation, must embody the most modern, the most reliable, and the most versatile nuclear weapons our research and development can produce. And until the world can develop a reliable system of international security, the free people have no choice but to keep their arms near. President Kennedy demonstrated that the price of peace and freedom is military superiority and the will to use it if necessary. This country, therefore, continues to require the best defense in the world. Do you believe that America should rise to this ultimate Soviet challenge and regain its military superiority or not? Right, Peace Poll, Boston, Virginia, 22713. We'll let the President and the Congress know how you stand, and we'll send you a free report in which top experts propose a new U.S. strategy for peace and freedom. The cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. And one path we shall never choose, and that is the path of surrender or submission.